Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Crew Seattle's May Luncheon, A Zero Carbon Future. I am Ashley Sherwood. Hopefully you can all hear and see me okay. Um, I am a partner with the law firm of Oles Morrison, Rinker and Baker, and also Crew Seattle's 2020 president. Uh, we're very happy that you could join us for our first virtual luncheon. Uh, virtual events are certainly becoming the new normal, and I'm excited to be able to bring this program uh, to you, even though or we are happy to bring this program to you, even though we can't physically be together. Um, a special hello to members from other crew network chapters that are joining us. I know several have joined us from um, all over the country and, and different coasts. Crew Boston, Crew Charlotte, Crew LA. I think one of the silver linings of doing virtual events is that we're able to connect more with uh, members from other chapters. We have really enjoyed joining your virtual programming over the past few months. So we are thrilled to have you joining us today. Before we get started, I wanted to thank our Crew Seattle 2020 sponsors. Thank you to Oles Morrison, Rinker and Baker, our 2020 Platinum sponsor. Thank you as well to our gold sponsors, Bentel Green Oak, b, b Builders, DPR Construction, Goodman Real Estate, Mortensen, Sellen, Skanska, Stokes Lawrence, Vulcan, and Unico. A thank you as well to our 2020 silver sponsors whose logos are on the slide in front of you. And thank you to our in-kind sponsors as well. We really appreciate that all of our sponsors, um, they're not just talking the talk, but they're walking the walk by sponsoring Crew Seattle. Um, and really outwardly showing their support for advancing the careers of women in our industry. So thank you. We couldn't do what we do and have the programming we have um, without our sponsors. Crew Seattle, uh, as many organizations um, have done, has made the decision to go virtual with all of our events and programs through June of 2020. Uh, we continue to monitor regulations and solicit member feedback to determine when the appropriate time will be to start scheduling in-person uh, programming and events. Uh, that being said, there are a few upcoming events to add to your calendars. May 20th, we have a virtual yoga session that we're co-hosting with a number of other Crew Network chapters. Uh, May 28th, we have a virtual happy hour hosted by President-elect uh, Kathy Leap and also events committee member Danielle Flatt. June 2nd, we have another virtual happy hour hosted by the Emerging Leaders Committee. In addition to an opportunity to grab your favorite beverage and connect with Crew Seattle members, our Emerging Leaders Committee will also be taking the time to answer questions about our mentorship program, which will be starting back up in September. And finally, the last thing to put on your calendar for the foreseeable uh, future over the next month or so is our June luncheon on historic preservation and adaptive reuse. That will also be via Zoom. And uh, some of you may recall that we had originally scheduled that for our March luncheon, which had to be canceled, canceled because of COVID. So we are thrilled to be able to uh, bring that program to you via Zoom. You can find all of this information uh, and links to register online at cruiseseattle.org. Please also connect with us via our social media platforms, the handles are on the screen in front of you. I am now going to turn it over to our programs committee member, Emerald Erickson. Uh, thank you, Emerald, for all the work that you've done in putting together this program. Um, Emerald is gonna go over some Zoom housekeeping items. I think everyone's getting pretty proficient at Zoom by now, but just in case, uh, it's always helpful to have some reminders. So Emerald's going to go over those housekeeping items and introduce our speaker for today, Amanda Sturgeon. Thanks, Ashley. So just a few of the Zoom housekeeping, housekeeping items. First, you guys uh, probably noticed you all came in automatically muted. All the participants have been muted. And then the video and chat functions have been turned off. Uh, the presentation is being recorded and will be distributed to all the attendees. And then 
If you have a question, please use the question and answer button down in the middle uh, of your screen. And we're gonna have questions at the end of the presentation. And, and then uh, we're gonna, once you, if you have a question, click on the question and answer, and then you can upvote those questions by clicking a like button. So please review the questions that, are, that have been asked already. And if it's the same one that you had, then you can upvote, upvote that question. And then as a, uh, we're, as a note, we're using the question and answer function. And so please ignore the, the raise hand function. So with that, I have the honor of introducing our speaker today. Amanda, award-winning architect Amanda Sturgeon is the new global head of regenerative design for Mott McDonald. She will be located in their Seattle, in their Sydney office, and will focus on strategies for regenerative zero carbon and biophilic buildings and infrastructure and cities. She's the former CEO of the International Living Future Institute, an organization that focuses on the transformation to a world that is socially just, culturally rich, and ecologically restorative. She was the founder and driving force behind the organization's Biophilic Design Initiative, which aims to connect people and nature within our built environments and communities. Prior to the International Living Future Institute, Amanda enjoyed a successful 15-year architectural career working on projects such as Island Wood on Washington State's Sainbridge Island. In 2013, she was elected as, the, as a fellow of the American Institute of Architects in recognition for her extensive ad advocacy and volunteer service to the green building movement, for which she has been a visionary leader. She was named one of the top 10 most powerful women in sustainability in 2015 as a recipient of the Women in Sustainability Leadership Award. She also wrote a book titled Creating Biophilic Buildings in 2017. Her 2018 TED Med talk focused on how her designs are helping people to recreate, reconnect with the world around them by breaking down the walls between inside and out. Amanda grew up in the United Kingdom, became a citizen of Australia, and currently lives on Bainbridge Island, Washington with her nature-loving family. Amanda, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Emerald. I appreciate that. Thank you for the introduction. All right, I'm just going to change over and share screens. Okay, hopefully that looks good to everybody. So thanks so much to uh, Crew Seattle for having me today. Um, it would have been lovely, of course, to have um, been at a luncheon together and to be able to meet people face to face. Um, but I think by now we're all getting used to, um, you know, meeting new people virtually and being able to work uh, anywhere in the world, which um, has its advantages. I as Emerald said, who have recently taken a new position and I will be moving to Sydney, Australia. So I've been experiencing this firsthand in that I have, have been um, working on Australian time and nobody really knows where I'm located as everybody's working remotely. So, um, so yeah, different times for sure. But thank you for having me. Uh, today I am going to focus, as you've heard, on a zero carbon future. Um, and sort of give some context as to why we need to focus on zero carbon future. And at the end, I'll sort of talk about the opportunities with the recovery from COVID-19, uh, the, the opportunities are to bring sort of economic stimulus together with, you know, zero carbon goals as well. All right. Um, so I want to put, you know, this topic in context first. Um, you know, these are some quotes from the UN Global Status Report in 2017. And, um, you know, firstly, uh, you know, this was when actually in 2017, it was widely thought that we were trying to prevent the world from increasing by two degrees. Um, I'll talk in the next slide about how that's now changed to 1.5. But, um, you know, in this UN Global Status Report, it talked about how 
Firstly, that buildings are critical to achieving the ambitions of a two degrees world or below. And secondly, really, you know, put a spotlight on how, um, you know, the building sector is going to grow. So essentially by 2060, you know, it's going to grow by the whole floor area of Japan every year. <laughs> And um, so 230 billion square meters, and this is obviously a metric. So if you want to put that into feet, you times it roughly by 10, 10 to 11. Um, so it's a lot. <laughs> and, um, you know, I wanted to talk about this first because I think when this report came out, um, what happened is that it really sort of brought buildings as a climate solution from being okay we'll do some energy efficiency and you know we know that you know we can do better in buildings to be like a whole spotlight of the climate solution and um you know then that furthered with uh the un intergovernmental panel on climate change report at the end of 2018 um where they also kind of lit a fire <laughs> i think under um you know the world really and said that look actually we've got to be at 1.5 degrees because a half degree more global warming um warming would mean more poverty extreme heat sea level rise habitat loss drought and we and we can't prevent this unless we act immediately it gave a time frame in the end of 2018 of 10 years to turn things around and um you know, that we'd need to reach complete net zero emissions by 2050 and, you know, half reduction by 2030. So, um, you know, I think what these um, two documents and the push of the UN and a few of the global action climate summits that they've done, um, you know, really sort of saw uh, a different movement, right? We've seen our youth, we've seen climate marches, um, you know, we've seen Greta Thornburg's very powerful, compelling um, statements, you know, and um, I think that's also really put a push on climate solutions. And frankly, in the building industry, what that means is that we, we need to step things up pretty drastically. Um, but we are starting to see that um, at the Climate Action Summit um, that was held in uh, 2019, um, we saw some statements like the African Development Bank saying no more coal, and that's pretty critical because, you know, it's predicted that Africa, given that, you know, there's hundreds of millions of people without access to electricity currently, that that will shift over the next, you know, 20 years, and there will be um, a huge impact in Africa if that's based on coal generation and coal power. Um, we also saw, uh, you know, the We Are Still In movement a couple of years ago that merged around the Paris Agreement. Um, and in the US, you know, 1,700 companies, and I think it's even more now, but most city mayors, universities, for example, committed to this We Are Still In movement. And what happened with that is the corporate sector started to, you know, make statements and commitments um, to how they were going to get to zero carbon emissions, and um, so did cities. And a lot of that centers around buildings. So I'm going to talk today about, you know, put a, put a U.S. and a bit of a global perspective on what's happening in terms of those kinds of commitments and what we can expect to see in the future. Um, so here's a slide that just pulls some of the cities, and um, there's a there's a couple of really great movements now that are bringing these city mayors and uh, leaders together, the C40 Cities Network and the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance. And um, the C40 Cities, which contains pretty much all, I think every single one of the mega cities and large cities in the world now, um, uh, have asked their cities to make specific commitments. So you can see here that some of the sort of, you know, leading ones, and they range from, you know, Melbourne and Australia that's already certified as a carbon neutral city to Copenhagen that will be doing it shortly in five years, um, Amsterdam, Milan, London are not far behind, and then some others that have made 2050 um, targets, which is a bit more common. And then we've just seen some cities like Sydney in Australia, for example, who had a 2050 target say, no, we're going we're gonna to make it by 2030. So, um, but pretty much every city, large city around the world has a carbon commitment and policies that they're um, unraveling and bringing out around that. And this is, I know we have some Boston people today, so I threw in some 
you know, Boston and um, LA sort of references too. What many cities have done too is, um, you know, outline exactly what their current emissions are, um, you know, from transportation, building electricity, building gas, building oil. And you can see in most of the denser cities, Buildings are actually a huge percentage. When you look globally, often, um, you know, buildings can be, you know, 40% or so. But when you look at these dense cities, um, and many of them, buildings creep up to be about 70% because often we have great transportation networks in our dense cities. Not always, but mostly. But just because we have so many buildings using so much energy, um, typically we're seeing the buildings are about 70%. And obviously that varies dependent on location. Um, so here you can see that, uh, you know, Boston actually has a, a sort of plan, if you like, to, um, you know, what that will look like in its reduction and how it will get there by 2050. Um, and that's not unusual for many cities. Now in LA, um, uh, the mayor uh, actually is the current chair of the C40 Cities Network and is extremely committed uh, to these issues. So. Um, there's been some great policy coming out of LA. We have uh, commitments recently to be 100% renewables by 2045 and 100% net zero carbon buildings by 2050. Um, so we'll start to see policies enact, you know, come out as, a, as part of these commitments um, that will try to get cities to these goals, but you know, it's not going to be easy. And we've seen cities have some of these commitments, maybe for some of them for 10 years or so. And um, what we're often seeing, for example, in Hong Kong is that, you know, Hong Kong was 78% short of their 2030 carbon emissions goals in 2018. So, you know, it's one thing to have a commitment, it's another to have policies, and then it's a whole nother issue to actually implement them and get to these kinds of goals quickly. Um, and, you know, we're also seeing that, you know, globally, despite the sort of push on energy efficiency, there was actually only a 2% increase in energy efficiency in 2018. And these are this is data from the International Energy Association. Um, and the other interesting statistic, uh, there was a great panel about this at the Davos um, cons um, conference, um, that 67% of energy is actually wasted. So it could be used more efficiently, um, it was wasted in some way along the line. So having heat on when you don't need it, you know, et cetera. Uh, lights on at night when there's no one in the building, um, for example. So you know, we have a long way to go just with the energy efficiency piece of buildings, um, a long, long way to go. And these are strategies that I think many of us may think, uh, you know, in Seattle may think are, um, you know, standard, especially with our energy code. But even in Seattle, um, you know, it's great that we have the buildings disclosure, um, but, you know, um, energy disclosure system in Seattle, but with that, it takes a while to get good data and to look through the data. Um, but the data that we did see so far shows that since 2008, when um, Seattle actually had a uh, commitment to kind of reduce by 60% by 2030, that the emissions have only declined by 5% in almost 10 years. Um, so clearly that's not going to be enough. And there's also been actually a slight increase in greenhouse gas emissions because of the way that, um, you know, uh, the fuel sources have worked and the uh, utilities have, you know, generated energy. So um, Seattle has been growing, so that's part of it. But um, clearly, we have a long way to go in Seattle as well. Um, one of the first key steps that we're seeing um, for most cities around the world is the move towards electrification and the move away from combustion. I mean, I was in a, in a couple of meetings just oh, three, maybe four years ago, where this was very heated. You know, I, I ran the institute where we made a stand on no combustion um, 15 years ago. And, you know, I was often laughed out of the room about that not being possible. But now we are seeing just in the last 18 months or so, a lot of commitments for um, electrification of buildings and a move away from combustion, including natural gas. You know, a decade ago, 
natural gas is really considered as sort of like the transition transition fuel um, and now it's really sort of pushed to the place of like no we have to get away from combustion of any kind um, we're seeing that crop up in policies all over the place and I will say the city of Vancouver is actually really the most progressive city that I've seen in terms of their goals. Um, well, Copenhagen and Melbourne are pretty close, um, but they have, um, they intend to achieve zero emissions for all new buildings permitted in Vancouver by 2025. You'll see some other city examples that are doing it for their own city owned buildings um, that I'll talk about in a minute, but Vancouver is actually doing it for every building that is permitted and this is not just for operational emissions, I'll talk about embodied carbon as well. They have extremely um, progressive embodied carbon goals with that. So um, we've also seen, you know, in New York, the Climate Mobilization Act got a lot of press um, when it came out last year. And, you know, the details of that or the centerpiece of that is that you know, buildings over 25,000 square feet have to start meeting pretty aggressive gas emission, greenhouse gas emission limits. Um, and, uh, you know, that's going to cause, you know, uh, building retrofits um, that will have to be in place. They have a, a PACE program for long-term financing for that, but um, that's not going to be an easy goal to achieve. So they're really looking at their existing buildings and how they get them to be you know, 40% better um, by 2030, which is only a decade away, given that some, you know, design and retrofit construction, you know, can take four to five years. Uh, that means that, um, you know, there should be a lot of work happening in New York to retrofit buildings over the next five years. Um, but as I said, in New York, buildings are responsible for 70% of all the greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, you know, they're pretty critical uh, for solving the climate issue. In, um, just in, Sma in San Jose, um, this was about six, eight months ago, um, they have stopped all new fossil fuel hookups for buildings um, to create a low carbon city so there'll be no more fossil fuels. Uh, San Francisco has banned natural gas in new city buildings um, and the plans an all construction ban. This was just announced in January. Um, so this is how fast things are changing. It's just the last three months um, seen a rollout of about a dozen different natural gas bans for buildings um, in the US. And I've been working uh, on this Governor Inslee climate executive order from two years ago that actually required zero energy buildings for all state owned facilities. Um, and I was working through the Institute with um, Department of Commerce to work with each of the different state agencies to figure out how they might get there and how they might train their, their teams and what those buildings might look like. So this has already been happening in Washington state um, for the last couple of years. Um, and in Seattle, um, you know, we now have Seattle for a Green New Deal, um, which sets the goal for Seattle to be carbon neutral city by 2030. And uh, this was, you know, fairly recent at the end of last year. And um, we're now starting to see uh, the mayor bring in various different um, policies that are related to this. So the first one that's, um, you know, come out, and this was pretty recent, maybe, uh, what, eight weeks ago or so, um, is no fossil fuels for new or renovated city and buildings by 2021. So this is saying is we have new city buildings, any city owned building um, from offices to you know, maintenance facilities across the city, there will be no fossil fuel connection. Um, and, uh, you know, it's only city owned buildings right now, as you saw in Vancouver, they've actually made those kinds of commitments and policies for all buildings permitted uh, in the city. And I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing those kinds of policies come out of the Green New Deal, um, you know, as each sort of policy gets enacted um, over the next year or two. So if you have, you know, a set of buildings that are, you know, dominated by gas, um, you know, heating and cooling systems, uh, there could be a movement to switch those out uh, coming uh, within the next five or so years. Um, 
The other one we saw, which was a little bit earlier, uh, September 2019, cities are also really trying to look at the residential sector. It's much harder to get to the, you know, thousands of small you know, homes um, and sort of, in theory, a little easier to get to the commercial buildings because you're dealing with less owners and, you know, got great initiatives like, you know, the 2030 districts that have been working with large city, you know, building owners for a while. Um, but this is about yeah, getting residences off heating oil uh, in Seattle. And um, it's been about, um, I think it's 3,000 households that they will look to transition to heat pumps. Um, and uh, there is actually a, a tax on oil that will fund rebates and grants for households to actually get there. Um, and there's about 18,000 is, is calculated oil heated homes in the city of Seattle. So it's expected to actually have, you know, one, one building at a time, one home at a time won't have, you know, big um, changes. But obviously, if it's, you know, 18,000 homes at a time, it will potentially. So how do we how do we get there with the building sector? What does that really look like? And, um, you know, I, I did this chart a few years ago, actually, for the Global Climate Action Summit in San Francisco. That was a buildings day that looked at how we might be able to go from if you look sort of follow this chart from the left. Um, you know, if we carry on as we are and, you know, have historical growth and um, are able then with that historical growth to get some good energy efficiency. We would be looking, given that the contribution of buildings is so significant, we would be looking at a 4%, um, you know, uh, a rise in temperature globally. Um, so, you know, I outlined sort of four steps to get there of what we need to do. So, you know, the first is we need to obviously create all new buildings to be, you know, near or zero energy buildings. Um, the second, which is what, you know, New York City's uh, policy is getting to, is about us having, you know, deep, you know, renovations. Um, and, you know, the third is then obviously looking at our energy supply. So I saw a great article in the New York Times actually yesterday morning that showed for the first time ever in the US, uh, the amount of energy generated from renewables outpaced the amount of energy generated from coal um, power plants. And that's a fantastic sort of trajectory that we're seeing. So we need more of that. And then the fourth step is about low greenhouse gas materials. And there's been a really good awareness push um, over the last year about the impact of embodied carbon, particularly you know, high carbon materials like cement and um, how we start you know, addressing embodied carbon of building materials as well. Um, so really those are sort of the four steps of how we get there. Um, and there's been some great uh, global initiatives as well. For example, with um, you know the World Green Building Council, which is the umbrella council for all you know the global green building councils. So each you know many countries have their own green building councils, like we have the U.S. Green Building Council. They're members of World Green Building Council, and World Green Building Council has been taking some leadership in getting um, you know reports out there and studies and getting people to commit to um, what they call advancing net zero. And there's actually, you know, a lot of uh, individual companies that have committed, global companies, to their, you know, net zero commitment. Um, but their, com their commitment is about, you know, all new buildings must operate at net zero carbon by 2030. And then all buildings must operate at net zero carbon by 2050. And they have um, also, you know, a step, key principles here, to get there, I really encourage you to take a look at their, um, you know, their report and their whole program on advancing net zero and think about, you know, whether your company could sign up and commit to their advancing net zero program. So I wanted to talk a little bit, um, to dig in a little bit to Seattle and show some, you know, buildings. And uh, this is a map that shows Seattle has a living building and it's also a existing building kind of 2030 program in place, which gives incentives on height for projects that will achieve higher levels of sustainability. Now it's only, you know, when you see the dark areas, it's only applicable to areas that have, you know, that kind of zoning. Um, so the denser areas of Seattle. So it's a you know, smaller percentage of Seattle that's eligible to participate in the program. 
But what we've seen is that we're seeing buildings and developers jump in to this program to be able to, um, you know, uh, get extra height and get to higher levels of sustainability. Um, you know, it's still sort of capped in the pilot, but, um, you know, I think programs like this can really incentivize developers to try to get to high levels of sustainability quickly um, and hopefully balance it out economically and figure out how to get there. So the most iconic one probably in, you know, in Seattle is the Bullet Center, which has been open now for a while. Um, you know, really set out to be an example of the city of not, not sort of just getting to net zero carbon where it might offset its carbon somewhere else, but to actually get to net zero energy on site. And many of you in Seattle would be aware of, you know, the Bullet Center already. Um, but the Bullet Center is actually able to achieve net positive energy. So it generates more energy than it uses. Um, as Dennis Hayes from the Bullet Center says, I, you know, he went overboard with the roof to, uh, you know, make sure it was going to be net zero energy. The roof probably could have been smaller. And of course, the panels are much more efficient now um, than they used to be. Um, in that uh, New York Times, you know, article I mentioned that I saw yesterday, it talked about how there's been an 80 percent increase in efficiency of, um, of PVs, um, which, uh, you know, we've seen them get so much more efficient so quickly uh, over the last few years. But, you know, being able to generate all the energy on your roof is, you know, that's about the height that you can go in, um, you know, to do that. I'm um, actually probably another story. I mean, the bullet center is six stories. You can probably go to about seven now with the efficiencies. Um, but other buildings are really looking at how they reduce their embodied carbon and their energy efficiency and then, you know, do a carbon offset. So purchase, you know, clean energy somewhere else. And that's, you know, these energy offsets, if they're done well and, you know, with good, um, you know, rigor in terms of where they're purchased, they're really helping to drive that renewable energy supply um, that is now outpacing the supply from coal. So this is 400 Westlake. Um, it's a project that's, you know, uh, shooting for zero carbon um, and it's an existing building below with a new building. And um, then, you know, some other projects that have joined the living building pilots, such as the watershed building in Fremont. Um, I'm not, they're aiming for significant energy reductions, but focus more on the water piece of it. And then I just wanted to pull a project. So we have a few people from LA that um, I've been connected with. It's the city of Santa Monica's city services building. And it's just opening, um, but that is also zero energy, zero carbon um, and a living building um, aiming for certification. So there are examples of these buildings that are popping up um, in all kinds of different climate zones and cities. And I think the importance of catalyst projects really is that, you know, it can demonstrate to people how strategies can be implemented. Um, we get good data from these buildings, you know, people can tour them and see them and learn from them. And we can also build, if you like, the professional services expertise. Um, that's something at the Institute that I really saw lacking is often we don't have, you know, really great sort of thinking and engineering and design skills to be able to think differently about these buildings. And, um, you know, we need to ramp that up pretty quickly. So I want to just jump to the corporate sector and talk about what we are seeing in the corporate sector here as well. Um, and I'm going to focus on Microsoft just because, uh, you know, they're, they're here in Seattle. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people are uh, aware of, of their announcement last year, actually early this year, it was just a few months ago, but they made this and you can read more about it. Actually, they have a great sort of site that has graphs and shows how they intend to get to carbon negative by 2030. But they're also going to actually account for their historical carbon emissions back to when they opened in 1975 um, by 2050. And they've started a climate innovation fund as well. So this graph is from their website um, where it shows, you know, going all the way to 1975 when they opened you know, how they're going to look at both their supply chain carbon emissions, their operational carbon emissions, and then do carbon removal projects um, to get to carbon negative um, by 2030. And um, some great data on their site, but uh, part of what they're doing, I thought it's important to explain, you might hear as you get into carbon work, scope one, scope two, like what that means, but they're 
quite clear about you know what the different scopes of energy and how they're going to address them and scope one is usually where buildings sit it's sort of stationary fuel combustion scope two is you know the energy supplied by the grid and then scope three is this sort of um, you know indirect emissions that you know we often forget about the the energy used to treat waste and, and water and um, energy losses in transmission and distribution, for example. So, um, you know, each of these kind of scopes really needs to be sort of treated differently. Um, so this is Microsoft's, you know, commitments here. So their first step is that they'll drive down those scope one and two emissions to near zero, and they want to do it by the middle of this decade. So that would be 2025. Um, they'll shift to 100% supply of renewable energy. Um, so they're creating power purchase agreements for green energy um, to offset 100% um, of the energy consumed by all their data centers, buildings, and campuses. So that's huge. Um, secondly, they'll electrify their global campus operations vehicle fleet. So they're gonna have only electric cars and vehicles. Um, and then thirdly, this is the piece that I was engaged in in my prior role at the International Living Future Institute. They've committed to certifying to zero carbon and LEED Platinum for their Silicon Valley campus and also for the renovation modernization that they're doing at the Puget Sound campus. Um, the other the key thing about Microsoft is that they've helped to support the immerse, immersion of, a, of an embodied carbon tool that's coming out called EC3 that's well, it's come out, it's available. Um, and other sort of embodied carbon um, efforts at the University of Washington uh, through the Carbon Innovation Networks uh, to sort of accelerate the embodied carbon, um, you know, awareness and tools and resources to be able to address you know, embodied carbon and building materials. So zero carbon certification is something that um, they have committed to and uh, it's available through the International Living Future Institute. Um, you know, LEED is also moved towards a LEED zero through their art program and um, you know, more and more corporates are looking to get certified in zero carbon and zero energy uh, so that they can, you know, have good benchmarks about, you know, achieving the, the um, reduction in carbon. So I did want to talk a little bit more about how carbon certifications work. Um, you know, there's really two pieces to it. We're familiar with operational carbon, you know, the amount of energy that we use in the running of the building, um, the lights, the heating, et cetera. Um, but the piece that, you know, we often haven't addressed as well, and because it's really difficult to assess accurately, frankly, and to offset, um, is embodied carbon. So that's the, you know, energy used to create all the materials and transport them, et cetera. Um, you know, the embodied energy is a one-time, you know, experience, obviously, unless, um, you know, the building is renovated frequently. And if it is, then that embodied carbon energy, you know, keeps going and has peaks and lows. Um, an operational energy of the life cycle of the building, of course, you know, is low at the beginning, but its impact, um, you know, is high uh, over the life cycle of the building. So they're both really key and really important. Um, so, you know, the key steps for zero carbon buildings and operations, of course, it's about reduction and energy efficiency. Um, reducing the site energy consumption, eliminating combustion, as we talked about, going to electric buildings. Um, and then once that's done, um, it's about offsetting either with, you know, on-site renewable energy uh, that's installed or procuring our renewable energy off-site or a mix of both of those. And then on the embodied carbon side, it's also about reduction. So looking at how you can reduce the carbon in the primary materials and more and more we're, we're seeing, you know, cement replacement uh, options in Vancouver, they're requiring uh, cement replacement and reductions um, in carbon and cement of about 40 or 50%. In the UK, it's going up to 60%. We're seeing a rise in mass timber buildings as people look at mass timber as an option. Um, so, and then of course there's the option to also really look at, you know, just the general materials reduction in buildings, not using as many materials um, and using local materials that have less of a transportation carbon impact. Um, and then there's the disclosure. So the piece of, you know, tracking and analyzing and doing reduction strategies is part of 
you know, tools like EC3 and others globally that are allowing us to actually calculate this. And this is kind of a new realm um, for the building industry to really accurately figure out how to, you know, reduce embodied carbon. Um, and then finally, um, once you've, you know, done reduction disclosure, um, it's about, you know, offsetting again, um, the total embodied carbon energy. So a couple of global companies that have made a zero carbon commitment uh, for all of their buildings worldwide are Salesforce and Kingspan. So Salesforce obviously had the San Francisco tower, actually building a tower in Sydney and uh, one in Dublin and others worldwide. And um, they have committed to zero carbon certification across all of their new buildings uh, globally as his Kingspan, and that's not just for their buildings and offices, but obviously they also have large manufacturing plants as well. And they're uh, exploring how they can get and committed to get to zero carbon um, in their uh, buildings in particular. So we're seeing more and more companies um, take this on. And um, as they, especially global companies, what's great is that they're, you know, as they, as they build their presence in a new country, um, that's sort of bringing awareness to zero carbon and you know, examples of how to achieve zero carbon to those cities and those locations. So we're seeing, you know, zero carbon commitments and achievements at all different scales. We've got the classic, you know, bottom right where, you know, I think it's, uh, you know, more net zero energy. So on-site energy generation, the smaller, you know, homes or, um, you know, remote locations, rural location buildings, but we're also seeing zero carbon at the Salesforce Tower in the top right, for example, and, um, you know, in our schools and uh, mid-sized buildings as well. So I think there was a myth that you could only really get to zero energy, you know, first with small buildings. Um, and uh, now, you know, there's creative solutions for buildings of all scale to be zero carbon. This is just a, you know, a sort of, um, collage of buildings that have achieved the zero energy, so on-site generation, and yeah, it tends to be the mid-scale type of building, um, but it's a great solution for library schools, uh, university buildings, for example, um, that are able to, you know, generate their energy on-site. And then, of course, with the denser, you know, urban high-rise buildings, we look at different strategies and offsets to achieve zero carbon. So I wanted to just spend um, a little bit of time uh, chatting about systems thinking as I close up here. So, you know, I think um, as human beings, but especially in the building industry, we're very good at thinking of one issue at a time. You know, we've been thinking about, I've been talking a lot about zero carbon, but you know, the last few years has been a big focus on health and wellness in buildings. Um, and, you know, what I'm really interested in is thinking about, you know, how we can bring those two conversations together, um, but also looking at the system of how we might make a zero carbon economy actually work. Um, you know, it's not just about, I've talked about policies, I've talked about commitments, um, and, you know, awareness building is pretty criti critical. So all of those sort of campaigns um, are a critical piece of getting to a zero carbon economy. But what we also need is market innovation. So, you know, certifications play a role, having new zero carbon product options, um, you know, having these catalyst examples built so people can see them, um, but also having visionaries, you know, in the community that can also you know, be the optimists among us to sort of try new things. And then ultimately, um, you know, social change is pretty key. I mean, we have to value this and we have to be willing to give up perhaps the Italian marble lobby for, you know, a different sort of set of priorities, for example. So, um, you know, all of these, you know, sort of aspects of a zero carbon economy are critical. You can't sort of achieve it without, you know, all of them playing a role. Um, so uh, I wanted to dig in just as I close a little bit more into, you know, some strategies of, well, what, you know, how do we get there? The city of Vancouver, I think, has a great outline. So the city didn't just make, you know, really sort of, you know, world leading commitment and some policies, but they also committed to this list on the left um, that they will in inform, you know, the city about what approaches work um, best under which conditions. 
they obviously have a role in identifying regulatory permitting financing barriers and removing those because often we've seen policies where there's barriers in place to permit them and um, you know it, it causes developers and building owners to take too much time to figure out how to you know how to address that um, they're sharing you know real estate development experience um, they're also helping with the development of the professional services I mentioned that there's often you know a lack of professional services available um, and really sort of enabling the build, the public to experience the benefits by you know demonstrating them and um, engaging with the public so I think they have a really great sort of systems thinking um, approach to how they actually get there um, in the sort of aggressive time frame that they've identified. Um, and yeah, then uh, the, the last um, point I wanted to make was just about, you know, well, how does all this fit now that we're sort of hopefully at the tail end of a pandemic? There's a great University of Oxford study that came out. It's actually led by leading economists, including a Nobel Prize, you know, winner um, economist, about how we could look at stimulus policies that also deliver, you know, um, net zero. Um, and you know, they outlined, I think it's five or six different strategies, and, and two of those were clean infrastructure and building efficiency retrofits. Um, and they looked at the economy of that and how it can actually drive the economy to um, move towards net zero solutions versus you know other solutions um, and you know it's interesting that they also identify that we're expected to see an eight percent i've seen ten percent in some studies as well in 2020 reduction of our global emissions caused by the slowdown um, you know, the economic slowdown of the pandemic um, that's great news, of course, but, you know, the question that I'm seeing emerge is, you know, how do we keep that and how do we maintain that? Um, and what do we learn from that to be able to, you know, keep our emissions down and achieve some of these really, um, you know, progressive goals. So that's everything that, that I have. Um, I really appreciate being able to chat with you today. I know that we're going to move towards um, some questions. I think Sarah is going to go through the Q&A um, and ask some questions. Thank you, Amanda. That was amazing. Um, there are a couple of questions. You mentioned two slides ago that there was examples of users experiencing the benefits other than the operational savings. And I would just be curious to know what kind of benefits other than operational savings are they experiencing? Uh, for zero carbon buildings benefits? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I mean, I think what I was referring to really was about, um, you know, in some cases, I mean, we're seeing a lot of these sort of technology companies uh, commit and, you know, most most developers and building owners would love to have tenants of technology companies. So, um, you know, what the technology companies are also committing to often, especially when you look at Google and Salesforce, is they've got zero carbon commitments, but they also have healthy health and well-being commitments. So, um, you know, what I'm seeing more and more is a pairing of, you know, healthy, you know, indoor environments, biophilic environments that connect people to nature and, you know, zero carbon strategies and that those actually go hand in hand. So, you know, being able to have natural daylight, you know, natural ventilation, for example, those are strategies that can reduce energy and carbon, but also help with health and wellness and help connect people to nature and, you know, have, you know, cleaner air and natural daylight. Um, you know, just natural daylight alone has been shown to, you know, increase productivity and, you know, test scores and recovery rates in hospitals, for example. So, um, you know, I think when we look at the synergies of strategies that can reduce energy, often the really good strategies are ones that improve health and wellness and productivity and happiness as well. And I think that's kind of the sweet spot of, you know, not just focusing on how do we reduce our energy um, you know, but also where can you do that in a way that improves health and wellness as well. Wonderful. I just also want to remind all our, our audience that if they have any specific questions, please to type them in the question and answer boxes and we'll get those, those asked. Um, another question was, do you think that with the pandemic and there is this huge reduction in emissions, which is amazing, 
what are the strategies people are coming up with to make those more permanent or is that is that happening or is it more subjective than that yeah i think it's a bit early to know you know um what strategies will come out of the pandemic you know recovery if you like um you know i think uh obviously there's a focus on health and wellness, but it's sort of switched towards being, you know, sanitization. And, um, you know, I, I saw a great study actually uh, this morning that was talking about, you know, the advantages and health advantages of being outside and, um, you know, having access to outside in actually, there's been some mapping that have shown where communities have spent more time outside, their infection rate has been lower. Um, so we've seen that, for example, in Australia and New Zealand, um, where I think there was this myth at first, well, summer, um, you know, means that, you know, it's killing off the virus. But I think some studies have shown that in countries where it's been summer during this, uh, they, people are to spend more time outside. And, um, you know, that's, you know, a healthier place to be and a healthier place for people's immune systems. Um, so I'm not sure what will emerge, but I hope that, you know, I think the opportunity is that um, we can look at sort of, you know, zero carbon and health together, um, as I said before. Wonderful. And we have a question from Helen Watley Adams. I'm going to allow her to talk. Helen, are you there? Okay, uh, I guess not. Another question that comes up is it, all these buildings, which, you know, contribute so much carbon to the emissions. I would be curious, what kind of user education have you seen for the people that are actually using the buildings, not the operators, but the users? Yeah, I mean, that is pretty key. When I, when we moved into the Bullet Center, we were the first tenants as the International Living Future Institute in there. And it was embedded within our lease that um, we didn't have to pay for our energy as long as we didn't go over our budget, our assigned budget, and we had to keep within a budget of energy. So, you know, there was also a dashboard that enabled us to see how much energy we were using per floor um, or per tenant. So, you know, I saw through that firsthand, and I've seen that be the case for several, you know, zero energy buildings and living buildings that I've worked with. Um, that, you know, you, you then sort of use energy differently. So, I mean, everybody goes in and they're like, I have to have a monitor and a laptop and I have to have my, you know, little fan under my desk and I, you know, and I need my desk lamp. And, um, you know, what happens I think there and what I've seen in other zero energy buildings is that people were actually part of, you know, this mission to reduce energy and save energy and were able to sort of see the impacts of that. So I think typically we just keep plugging things in and, and as building envelopes get more efficient, the plug loads and how we use them are going to be critical to drive down the energy use. So um, yeah, there's a huge occupant issue with zero energy, zero carbon buildings. I think there's a lot of good examples of where dashboards of energy use and lease agreements that can kind of limit energy use or give incentives for getting below a budget um, you know, can be really powerful ways to change kind of people's behavior. Great. Has there been any concern that you've seen that with the pandemic that some regulations might be relaxed to help businesses um, at all? Well, yeah, I think, I think that is a concern, right? That, um, you know, we have pushed back as we hit, you know, a recession that, you um, you know, we want to loosen anything that causes more expense for businesses. Um, I think, I think if perhaps this pandemic, this is just my personal view, had happened maybe two years prior, I think that would have been quite likely. Um, but there's such a big wave of policies that have already been passed, um, you know, over the last six months, um, you know, prior to the pandemic happening that I don't think we can go backwards now. And I think when we're seeing, you know, sort of renewable energy generation outpace coal, you know, despite there being federal government, you know, support uh, verbally and financially to prop up the coal industry, it hasn't worked. I mean, it hasn't been a good economic solution um, and it hasn't, you know, preserved jobs, for example. So I think, I think the movement is too far ahead at this point to go backwards? I mean, that's certainly my hope. Great. 
And then last question, as the people that are working in operating and building these buildings, what would you ideally have us do to have the most impact to get to that zero carbon future? Um, what would I do to have the most impact? Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think we have to have, I mean, we've got, you know, in Seattle, for example, I think everyone needs to follow Vancouver's policy and, uh, and, you know, well, there's pieces of it. Vancouver's policy on new buildings, I think what New York has done on existing buildings, really looking at, um, you know, a fund that can support significant retrofits over a period of time. Um, I think a combination of those two um, is pretty critical. You know, a mandating um, not just past city buildings, which is what LA and Seattle have done, but uh, into all buildings permitted and to, um, you know, and to really have a clear progressive policy around existing buildings that's attached to a fund and financing mechanism to do those kinds of retrofits. So I guess that's sort of those two things there that I would pair together to make the most impact. Well, I mean, I want to thank you um, for Crew Seattle and all the other crew chapters that have been able to join us. This was an amazing presentation, one that I really got a lot out of. Um, and I hope you, um, I hope we hear more and are able to get closer to this zero carbon future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.